Hello and welcome to another edition of the Proto Balls Podcast. I'm Protomet. I'm Barry. And today we will be taking a look at Mobile Suit Gundam Char's Counterattack. And it has been a very long time since we've done any Gundam content on this podcast. God, I wonder why. It's <laughs> almost like the Zeta movies are ass. <laughs> Yeah, we decided to just skip the remainder of the Zeta movies because they're terrible. We watched the first one. We watched the first one, right? And it made no sense whatsoever. ever. So we watched the TV show, right? For for comparison, the TV show is much better paced. <laughs> like it's not even like like the original mo- the original trilogy is very is still very well paced because it's a trilogy of like it's a. I, I don't know if middle, like, because there's a lot of, not filler, but there's a lot of stuff that you could easily take out of, right. middle, uh, uh, of, of uh, Mobile Suit Gundam, the original show, and cram into three movies. Unlike Zeta, where everything is plot relevant. Yeah, there's, there's not a whole lot that can be cut, and unfortunately the Zeta movies did, and suffer for it, and th- they even changed the ending, which... I understand it was because Tamino is a lot was a lot was had become a lot more hopeful, and he didn't want to end with the downer ending that Zeta had. Yeah. So. Yeah. So inst- yeah, so he didn't want things to be downer, which is why we got a double Zeta. <laughs> no, the down. I meant he didn't want it to be downer. That's why he changed the ending to Zeta with the movie. So. Oh yeah, that's lame. Yeah, no, double Zeta probably had its own. <laughs> wonky history which yeah and then he decided all right so i've already done so so mind you this is already this is already after tomino has already sort of changed things up now if i remember right because he already did mobile he did gundam he did he did zeta he immediately and then after zeta he did g gundam no. At, no? No, G Gundam didn't come out until the 90s. This is still the 80s. Really? Hold on. Yes. The, t- the timeline of releases, not counting any of the OVAs, are Mobile Suit Gundam, Zeta, 94. Double okay, Zeta. I gotcha, gotcha. And then, and then Char's Counterattack. Now, I think there was some, some SD stuff in the, mit- in the midst there, but that's... That's not canon. <laughs> yeah, and just for the sillies. <laughs> still, G. Uh, still, for my money, G Gundam's the best non-Universal Century Gundam. I did recently do a top ten list of my favorite Gundam shows, and that was number one. <laughs> yeah, the G Gun. Dude, G Gundam's great. I highly. That's like I know we haven't started talking about it movie or anything yet, and we haven't done recommendations yet. But G Gundam. I mean, come on. I've already recommended it, so yeah, you can't you can't recommend I'm it. I'm just saying. Come on, G Gundam. It's the best. It is. It is a. It is basically ultimate muscle meets wrestling meets giant robots. I was gonna say Gundam meets Street Fighter, but okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, that too. Yeah. Yeah. Gundam meets Street Fighter. That actually works better. Yeah. Because it's the the world tournament or whatever. Right. And they all fight on Earth because they're all assholes and they don't want to fight in their own fucking planets. Or is it sp- is it space colonies? They're space colonies. They're like space colonies. Giant space yeah. colonies, but yeah. I actually a while back re- read like a whole long article, ex- basically explaining the history of the series and the science behind it. So this movie's two hours long, which is about how long each mo- each of the original movie trilogy was. Right, and uh, I hate to say it. But this movie feels like there's even less happening than this than like some some of the other movies. To be fair, this movie is more about like a small handful of battles rather than a whole war. Yeah, this so well. This movie, I don't know. This movie does not feel like the the right bookend to end the Universal Century on. Which is why they kept going with the Universal Century. Yeah, but like. <laughs> Like this, because this is this is the, uh, the uh, smart. Like this is not a spoiler alert if you've seen the rest of the series, but this is the end of Char, as it were. 
Right. This is this is the uh, yeah. This is the end of Shar Aznable as a character in the series. I mean, trust me, there could be a, a worse way to end, to end off the right. Universal does Amuro does Amuro even show up in the rest? After nope. The, yeah. So this is the end of Amuro and for and all Char. intents and purposes, Shar and Amuro die at the end of this movie. Spoiler alert for everything, but that that's the story that Sunrise, Bandai, and everybody that's worked on this series and will work on the series are sticking to. <laughs> yeah, that they're dead. <laughs> yeah. More I, or less. More or less. I mean, yeah, they, yeah. The, the way the movie ends does kind of... It leaves it open for interpretation and a lot of people have interpreted that that they're dead. <laughs> that they, they both die. <laughs> yeah. No, the the worst way to cap off uh, the Universal Century is with G-Savior. But that's a topic for another day. <laughs> So uh, the the year is Universal Century ninety three. It's been a couple a couple years. About six years since the the grips conflict, and I'm actually going to take a bit of a a side tangent and basically explain what happened in Zeta and Double Zeta to get you up to speed on what happened. Yeah. Just just this is. We've already talked about it's, what happened in the in the Gundam movies. Yes. Yeah, so, so so it has been yeah it's been uh. 14 years since the One Year War, which is where the, the Mobile Suit Gundam movies take now, place. By the time of 80, 87, which is what Zeta had happened, yep. the Federation had formed a, a splinter group called the Titans, which were dedicated to preventing a second Zeon uprising in the aftermath of some event that uh, got detailed at a later point in real world history. So we're going to ignore that for now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but... <laughs> 9-11? No! No! Oh. <laughs> no, as, I, as no a, I mean a, a, a series that came, that got released later, oh, gotcha. but wasn't available when Zeta and Double got, Zeta got, they did. They pulled the, uh, they, they pulled the Rogue One. Basically. And yeah. It works, <laughs> but yeah, that's not relevant, but by 87, the Titans have basically had a stranglehold on the colonies. Much to the chagrin of the people actually living in the colonies, because they're treated as second-class citizens regardless of status, and it, basically it's become a fascist government. Yeah. So yeah. So basically, the the corrupt federation that was fighting against a neo-fascist government seeking independence from itself, and also you know looking to genocide everyone on Earth because how dare they control us from earth while we're up in space yeah that federation uh ag basically they uh th you're, you're probably gonna be lost on this they 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 likely pulled an operation paperclip pulled out a bunch of uh, pulled grabbed a bunch of zeon scientists and like government officials that were willing to like defect right and then they formed their own sort of group to... There are some spin-off medias that do reveal that some Xeon soldiers, at the very least, did start working with the Federation. Yeah. Though whether or not that was Operation Paperclip or not... Right. No, exactly. And you know what Operation Paperclip is. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for those who, who may not know, uh, after World War II, uh, the United States uh, basically... Uh, Get, pardoned a bunch of Nazi scientists and brought them over, and uh, their fundamental work, both in during not during the World War II and after the war, is why we have men on the moon. Why why we managed to get men on the moon because of their their their, their work in rocketry and, and missiles and whatnot. It's kind of like how Unit Seven Thirty One was influential in telling us a lot about human biology. Yep. <laughs> That's a different story. <laughs> Modern medicine is what we is what we have based on human atrocities. Just yeah. just put that into perspective. <laughs> Not that that's particularly relevant to what we're talking about, but anyway, the Titans have gotten a stranglehold. Yes. A, it's it's a, yeah, it's kind of it's it's sort of along the lines of like they started as a they started as like an anti they sort of like a counterintelligence group. But then they sort of they wormed their way into the Federation government itself, and sort of just kind of took control of. They they sort. It's more like they were formed as a specialist unit specifically to deal with potential uprisings. Correct. And just grew in power and. 
and their leader just just basically basically he's Dagwin Zabi all over, <laughs> but like pro federation. So yeah, the Titans are led by Yamato Hyman and his second in command Basquam, a splinter group of basically civilians and rebels formed the Anti-Earth Union Group, or like, AUG. Yeah, like, the AUG is not just civilians and rebels, but also high-ranking officials that are anti-Titan. In the Federation. In the, within the Federation, yeah. Like, they, they can't see what the Titans are doing. It's like, that's not what they should be doing. They should not have the ability to do this so wantonly. But I can't... Do force them because I'm not in enough of a position of yeah, power. They, yeah, but it's like the middle management people, like Bright Noah. He's he's a high, he's a fairly high ranking official at this point because he's a he's a captain in the original series. At this point, he's what like a like an admiral or something like that. I don't know the exact rank, but uh, the Titans clearly don't see him as worth shit. Yeah, <laughs> considering how they're how they're so dismissive and. Actually, literally beat him up. <laughs> yeah, they they beat the shit out of Bright Noah. They have uh, the Federation has Amado Ray, like sidelined, for reasons. I think it's because they didn't. They don't. They they are uh, afraid of the fact that his new type of abilities could be used to harm them. <laughs> so they're yeah. keeping him under tight observation. Anyway, yeah. the Titans are bad. Ayug is formed to oppose them, comprised of a bunch of groups. Uh, a kid by the name of Camille Badan ends up joining the Ayug. He winds up giving along, helps them steal a, a mobile, the Gundam Mark II, which along with their own, te which, which along with their own technologies and um, and Camille's designs is able to create the Zeta Gundam. I'm trying to yeah. fast forward through this he, so that we get to Zeta. Yes, he, I, <laughs> or and, Char. and I will say Camille Badan. He's also mentored by a suspiciously uh, familiar-looking Lieutenant Quattro, whom uh, whom Kai just outright identifies as a Char. Yep. <laughs> he leaves the letter as like Quattro Vagina is a Char. <laughs> yep. It's you know, like it's he's 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 char like it's it, it's not even subtle like they outright say it a few times like, he, he, for all intents and purposes he's Quattro Bagina until he says otherwise. Yep. <laughs> he pull he pulls the Schrodinger Schrodinger char. But yeah, the AUG is opposed to the uh, atrocities the Titans are committing. They get into a, the Titans and the AU get into a fight. Uh, at some point, ne the remnants of Zeon calling, now calling them Neo Zeon, and headquartered in a mobile asteroid called Axis, they show up, led by Haman Karn, who is ostensibly w working under the supervision of the f surviving Zabi family member of Mineva Zabi, and she apparently has a relationship, a past relationship with Shar, which is not detailed in I in either this double Zeta or Shar's counterattack, but does eventually get explained in a side story. Um, the AU initially asked Neo Zeon for help in fighting the Titans, which is kind of ironic. <laughs> right. Uh, but ultimately, Neo Zeon winds up joining forces with a splinter group of the Titans led by Paptimus Shiraco, who has his own designs of taking over the Titans. There's a huge battle, which has massive casualties on both sides of the Aeug and Titans. The Titans are defeated. The Aeug are in dire straits. And then Haman Karn is like, okay, now we're the bad guys that you're having to fight against, which leads us into D Double Zeta, where a bunch of kids from the... Uh, derelict colony Shangri-La, which is one of the earliest colonies, uh, they sneak aboard the Argama, one of the AU ships, and attempt to steal their mobile, their Gundams. Uh, the leader of this ragtag group of teens, Judah Ashta, winds up being so impressive as a pilot for the Zeta Gundam that he that the AU basically hire him and the other kids to join up and give Judah the double Zeta. <laughs> Which is a 
so combined this, our mobile suit. So correct me if I'm wrong. Amuro does show up in Double Zeta. No. <laughs> no? So so Shar and Amuro just don't show up in Yeah, it. Shar just disappears after the end of the Grips conflict, which is the battle. Well, because they is... technically won, didn't they? Right. Amuro ended up joining up with an Earth based group called Karaba, and they're mostly a side group that barely show up in Zeta at all anyway. Yeah. And they just don't appear in Double Zeta at all. But the uh, Federation are uh, so war-weary that they are basically giving Neo Zeon the ability to run roughshod to the point where they actually launch a second Operation British, which drops a colony on, I want to say, Dublin? <laughs> How fitting. How fitting. Britain invading, uh, Britain invading Ireland? Wow. <laughs> Who would have thought? I mean, I didn't intend it like that. I was just referencing the fact that Zeon dropped a colony yep. during yep. no, I and get called it. it Operation British. I get it. No, I get it. But eventually the AU do manage to defeat Neo Zeon and de defeat Haman Karn and take Maneva Zabi into custody, except that it's not actually Maneva Zabi. Not that that's super important because that won't get explained for a good long while in the real world, but... <laughs> That leads us up to the events of 0093, Shar's counterattack. By this point, Shar has reemerged and basically has embraced the fact that he is both the the ace pilot from the One Year War and a hero of the Ayug, but also the son of De of Zeon Zum Daikun, the man whom Zeon is named after. <laughs> yeah, and as the movie re as this movie reveals, he's actually a popular. Po Political figure in the in the gov in the Neo Zeon government. So the movie starts on Earth. <laughs> we're like 15 minutes into this movie, talking about into this podcast, talking about a movie, and we're finally talking about the movie. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. People are running away. Uh, there's elite. There are people who are living illegally on Earth. <laughs> yep. Because the whole point of people being sent out into the space to live in the colonies was to deal with the overpopulation. And the Federation doesn't want these people coming back. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> like, you would think that, given everything, it would be the higher class citizens who would be living out in space, looking down on the people of Earth. Nope. But no, it's the exact opposite. <laughs> Now, one of these illegal immigrants isn't actually an illegal immigrant. Her name is Quest Parai, and she is the daughter of a politician in the Federation whose name I can't remember outside of it ending with Pariah. <laughs> Pariah. Pretty much. Pariah. Uh, it's a, it, it, you know, I just realized her name sounds exactly like Pariah. <laughs> a Pariah. Yeah? A parasite. <laughs> Which is fitting. Yeah, she sucks. Straight up, <laughs> straight up. I'm not even gonna. I'm not gonna lie with you. Lie with you. She fucking sucks as a character. I think it works because she's a rebellious teenager. She's that's the entire point. That's the entire point of her character. She's a rebellious teenager who thinks she knows more than the adults, she's or thinks that she's more mature than she actually is. She's a stupid fucking character, and that's kind of the point. <laughs> she. La she let me be blunt. She causes all the problems in this movie. With, I, I wouldn't say she causes all of the problems. She causes, causes some of the problems. No, she causes all of the problems. There is a specific scene where Amuro has Char in his sights, and she fucks it up. She could. This whole thing could have been avoided. Right, but there's also Federation corruption that we'll get into. Sure, right. <laughs> But with she certainly didn't help the si the situation. She, she actively made the situation worse than it could have been. She pulled a Jar Jar Binks. No, oh. <laughs> worse than that. She pulled a Jar Jar Binks in fucking what was it? Attack of the Clones or Revenge yeah. of the Sith? What, whichever one where some, was, where Jar Jar Binks is a senator is like you know I I agree, I agree with Palpatine. We should get, do what Palpatine says. Yeah, that was Revenge of the Sith. <laughs> okay. I yeah. couldn't remember because because he becomes a, becomes a side character in the second movie, and then I couldn't even remember if he actually 
showed up in the third. All right. It's just... Uh, <laughs> uh, Ad Adenauer. Yeah, Adenauer Pariah is the, the dad's name. I was going to say Andalusia, and I, even I knew that was wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, unfortunately... Yeah, and it's like, oh... Um, and then uh, there's also Mirai Noah, who uh, is from the original series... She's and a minor character my, here and in Zeta. Yep, but she is Bright Noah's wife, and she has two kids. They're also trying to escape, but only one is allowed to leave, thanks to Adnauer's influence. And that would be H Hathaway. Hathaway. <laughs> Hathaway is allowed to leave. And he becomes a bit important in his own right, to the point where he actually has a whole couple, few spinoff mon or novels, she has spin off fuck. novels, which got adapted into movies. Fuck Hathaway. Honestly, you no, know, fuck Hathaway, dude. In the in the context of this movie, absolutely. <laughs> fuck this kid. <laughs> He's about as bad as Quest with regards to being a teenager. <laughs> Qu yeah, yeah, here's the thing. Quest, Quest and Hathaway have zero impulse control. They're teenagers. I get it, but Quest is miles worth because not only is she a spoiled rich kid, but she's an entitled spoiled rich kid. Yeah. She f she feels as if she's superior to everyone else because she thinks she's a new type. And she doesn't even have confirmation yet that she is one. I mean, later she do it does get confirmed that, yes, she's a new type, so she technically earns that entitlement. But she's still an entitled bitch. <laughs> Fuck Not her. the movie. <laughs> yeah. No, like, yeah. We'll get into it. Li we'll get into it later. No. But on the topic of Bright Noah, he's now in charge of a splinter group of the Federation called Blondo Bell, who are basically, basically the remnants of the AU, <laughs> in that they are trying to stop bad stuff from happening. Yeah, pretty much. Like and, the, and they have quite a they have a bit of autonomy, but they are still beholden to the law. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. Long story short, uh, the AU disbanded in uh, you know in between the time between Zeta and Double Zeta. No, they disbanded after Double Zeta because okay, they, they were the the main focus of okay. Double Zeta. And yeah, Zeta. they they so they disbanded after Double Zeta and Amaro and Co. basically went back into the into the fold of the Federation government. And the Federation government is still fucking corrupt. Oh, oh absolutely. and as it turns out, you know, and Char's the new leader. I, I, Char's the new leader of Neo Zeon, right? Oh, as it turns out, the, 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 the Federation government somehow got even worse than it was in Zeta. They, they we'll get we'll get into that soon enough because uh, in, in the midst of Hathaway, Quest, and and, and what uh, Adnauer Adnauer leaving Earth, they pass by an asteroid that Neo Zeon has dropped onto Earth in the Tibet region, Casa. I forget. I Casa. I don't know. La Laza. Laza. Laza <laughs> Tibet. So. Yeah, the, they, they, yeah, so, yeah, the, the neo Zeon forces drop an asteroid into Laza, Tibet, which kills an astronomical number of people, because let's... And that's, and that's just them testing out their own theory. Yep. And, it, and it's gotten to the point where the Federation is so ineffective that their Earth defenses can't stop, do any, they can't do anything. This isn't, this isn't a case of Operation Britain. Where, like, the Federation got caught flat-footed, and they, they didn't see it coming. This is more a case of they saw it coming and did nothing. They saw it coming and did nothing until it was too late. They sent out just a group of mobile suits. They didn't send out an entire armada. Yeah, it's a bad situation all around. <laughs> so... Yeah. So yeah. Ad, ad, so, so ad, yeah. <laughs> Adenauer. Yeah. Adenauer. Quest and Hathaway managed to leave. You know all they, that. They link up with a unit uh, of Londo Bell that is being captained by Bright Noah and has yep. Amro on board, and he's given a new mobile suit, the new Gundam. Yep. Not not N E W, V. <laughs> yeah. New Gundam. It's pronounced New Gundam. <laughs> and um. And it's it, it's a 
it's a specially designed Gundam specifically to to account for Amaro's uh, it is, uh, psycho frame. It is developed using a material called psycho frame, which is basically like microscopic processors that are combined into a metal. Nano machines, son. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> and psycho psycho frame actually becomes fairly significant both both in spin-off media is both before and after this movie. So it, it's not something that goes away. <laughs> no, it's not going to go away anytime soon. But nevertheless, uh, yeah, so uh, Quest and Hathaway are shown the new Gundams and the new mobile suits and everything, and Quest is such a fucking bitch. I was like, why is this lady working with Amuro? I should be working with Amuro. I'm a new type. I was like... Bitch, this person actually works with Amaro. She is a full. She is an employee. Yeah, yeah she <laughs> she's had, allowed to be even near Amaro. Yeah. You're a civilian who just Ch got. <laughs> yeah, Ch Chianagi. Who uh, only appears in this movie, and we'll get into that later. Oh. Yeah. Now, some of you uh, may have noticed that at no point have we mentioned Bell Torture to Irma, Amaro's girlfriend from Day to Gundam. And that's because she was cut out of this movie. <laughs> yeah, that makes... Yeah, I, the, I origi know. the original draft of this movie had her showing up as Amro's wife, and that got cut, but apparent, uh, there is a novelization that does incorporate her. Apparently the original idea for the movie got adapted into a novel. Man, whatever. Which is just one of the numerous uh, mo novels <laughs> written by Tomino. <laughs> That's basically his alternate universes. <laughs> for real. Yeah, it... For, for the record, I, I've read his original novel trilogy based on the original series. Yeah. And it is well worth a read. <laughs> so... It, it does so much different. <laughs> so, uh... So, the, so, yeah. So there's, you know, there's this starting... Uh, st stressors with Quest just kind of being annoying. Um... Hold on. And so the the Londo Bell the Lon, the Londo Bell fleet goes to Londoni Londonium Londonian. That's in uh, side six, right? I think so. It's it's definitely the neutral colony from the original series. Yes. Um, because they're going to go into negotiations with Shar to try and foster a peace treaty, which ultimately amounts to. Uh, Char and Neo Zing being like, hey, here's a bunch of money. Sell us Axis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> the Federation's whole idea is that they don't want Char attacking the colonies and completely ignoring the fact that Neo Zeon just dropped an asteroid onto Lhasa. <laughs> so their idea is, well, we'll take a payoff that they're giving us and sell them an even bigger asteroid. <laughs> so that he doesn't attack the colonies. Yeah, also Char's there. <laughs> yeah, I, I mentioned he was yep, there. Yep, I mean, like, Char's there in the neutral colony meeting with Federation. Just think about that for a second, you know. If, like, the, f the only time anything close to this happened before in the series is when Daegwen Zabi went to to go meet with Admiral, uh, what's his name? Oh, you mean with re in regards to a major political yeah. figure meeting with the other side? Yes, yes. I thought you meant Char being in Side 6. No, no, he no, 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 no. That's how he and Amro first met. No, <laughs> Outside no. of combat. Yeah, no, not that, no. <laughs> yeah. I misunderstood what you meant. <laughs> yes, the, yeah, the, on the only other time something like this happened in the series is when Daegwen Zabi went to meet with Admiral, uh, Ah, uh, what's his name? Well, actually, I think something similar happened in Double Zeta, but I can't remember offhand. Yeah. Met me with it's, the it's been a while since I've seen Double Zeta. Mm, yeah, met with the Admiral of the Federation to end the war because Dagwin was afraid that his son was going to fucking kill them all. You're right. And he was right! <laughs> a little too late, but... <laughs> well, I mean, it's better that he realized it at all. Yes, yes. <laughs> My son's Hitler. Oh my god, what have I done? <laughs> it's still one of my favorite scenes from the original Mobile Suit Gundam. Yep. Daegwin just calling his own, comparing his own son to Hitler, unironically, and his son just being like, 
Okay, and? <laughs> yeah. Okay, and I'll show you somebody who's compared to Hitler. Watch me. <laughs> and just not understanding it at all. No. What? That's because that's cause his son sucks. His son sucks, but he's like, he's so far removed. Man, if only Dozo was the old. If only Dozo was the oldest. <laughs> Unfortunately, he's third. <laughs> yep, unfortunately, he's third. Or fourth, depending on t how Sathro fits into all I, this. I can't remember. <laughs> whatever, yeah. No one talks about Sathro because he I did. Feel like, you know what? I feel like Cassilia probably would have been a better option, too. Yes! <laughs> Honestly, yes. <laughs> yes! Cassilia, Dozel, and... Uh, uh, Garma? And Garma would have been a better option compared to fucking... I, I feel Garma may have been a bit too... Uh, Grain for the position. Garma, Garma was definitely a bit na uh, naive, right? But he was at least a popular. He was, figure. A, he was a popular, comp uh, semi-competent figure, and he had sh the backing of Shar for, <laughs> for all that meant. <laughs> for all that meant. <laughs> I've never betrayed anyone. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, so I killed your brother, and that just felt let me feeling empty inside. So I. So, oh, by the way, Cassilia, here, I'm going to shoot you with a rocket. I I'm going to shoot you with a bazooka. I love that scene so much because it's just, it's Cassilia realizing, oh, fuck. <laughs> and then you get only a couple of shots of the frame, but you see her head come clean. She gets decapitated she gets via bazooka. Via bazooka. Which would not happen in a Tomino thing until Ideon. It's just, it's just <laughs> insane. It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> Never, so nevertheless, uh, so Shar, uh, so Amaro's, Amaro's riding Quest and Hathaway around, and then they see Shar, and Amaro gives chase to Shar, and uh, Shar's he, on a horse. Ha Shar's Amaro's on a horse. in a buggy. <laughs> they catch up to one another, and they start a big, they start a little fist fight, right? Which but, is a very memeable moment. <laughs> and Amaro gets a gun, and points it at Shar. Got him dead to rights. And what does Quest do? This fucking bitch. This fucking stupid teenage twat. Alright? She fucking grabs the other gun that's lying on the ground and points it at Amaro. No, I think she disarms Amaro and oh, grabs she, Amaro. Oh, yes, that's gun. right. She disarms Amaro and steals it. Yeah. <laughs> fucking bitch. This fucking bitch. Now, at around the time this is going on, Cameron, Mirai's fiance from back in the original series, uh, informs Bright Noah of the fact that, hey, the Federation just got a massive payoff for Axis. Like, they literally just gave us a whole bunch of gold. You should probably look into that. <laughs> I am in deeply concerned. Also, how, how is Mira? I haven't spoken with her in a while. Yeah. She's doing good? She's doing well? She's doing all right. <laughs> and it's like, hey, priorities, guy. I mean, yeah, he, he's got his priorities. He's just like, well, since I'm here, I may as well ask. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy. Cam Cameron's an alright guy compared to the rest of the Federation. Not that he's even a member of the Federation. He's like a third party intermediary. He basically, yeah. And he's like, wait, they're just handing out gold in exchange for Axis? This feels so wrong. <laughs> yeah, the... That's... Let's be, let's be, let's be, let's be honest. Let's be honest here. Look, the Federation gets what it deserves. In oh, the, absolutely. Throughout the series. <laughs> like, okay, we'll sell you this asteroid, and like, as if we're not expecting something to happen. They, oh my god, they pull the fucking Hitler thing. We'll give you what you want, as long as you promise not to do anything else. Cross my heart. Cross my heart and hope to die. <laughs> hey, I want... Hey, guys, I want Austria. No, you can't have Austria. I took Austria. All right, you can have Austria, but you can't have anything else. Hey, guys, I want Czechoslovakia. You can't have Czechoslovakia. Whoa. I took Czechoslovakia. All right, you can have that, but nothing else. <laughs> hey, guys, I want Poland. No, that's it. Hard line on Poland here, bud. So I've got Poland now. <laughs> so I got Poland now. God damn it! Yeah. God damn it, Hitler! <laughs> God damn it, Hitler! Now we've got to declare war. You know how many millions of people are gonna die now because of you? Um, is it gonna be comparable to how many people are already dying because of me? I mean, yes. 
<laughs> what a terrible tragedy. Oh my goodness. I feel so just awful about this. <laughs> fucking Hitler. Yeah, no, oh, no Hitler. I just I just realized that now. That's what they're doing. They're doing fucking they're just giving them what they want in hopes that he doesn't that they don't do anything more. <laughs> Knowing that Char's not trustworthy. But they also need money to pay for their welfare programs. Yeah, apparently the money they get from this is going to go for their go into their welfare pl plans. It's like, <sighs> yeah, fuck, what the fuck? <laughs> well, how else are we gonna pay for the welfare? I don't know. Cut your own pay. Cut your own pay. Tax the citizens. I don't know. Something. Anything. Jesus Christ. No. I, uh, that may, that actually upsets me now. <laughs> That's that makes me very upset. So yeah, so yeah, Char gets away by the way because of Quest, that fucking bitch. And he takes her with her because he's he thinks she has the potential to be a new type. I mean, he's right, but Quest doesn't think that's the reason. And now Quest is hanging all over Char, which upsets Gune. <laughs> Who is a cyber new type who has been enhanced at the Sweetwater new type facilities or whatever. Yeah. I think Sweetwater is a colony. Basically part of the part of the agreement is that uh, the co the Sweetwater colony is declared part of Neo Zeon territory or something. Yeah, mm. so the so the asteroid of Axis, long long story short, uh, they, they send like they send a they send Adnauer out to basically be the, the, the watching eye of the, the disarmament of Axis. Like, to, to remove all the nuclear weapons that are on Axis now that they've sold Axis to Neo Zeon. They didn't think to disarm it before selling it. So No, I think that all happens around Luna 3? Luna 2? Well, the, no, yeah. Well, no, they... they do they also launch an attack on Luna 2 to get its nukes? Because I, I know Luna... I think so. Yeah. Okay, so it's like a a pin a pin a two pronged attack. Yeah, they they do a two pronged attack to just take the take access by force and steal all the nukes from Luna 2. Yep. Okay. Yep. Basically, and so uh... Quest proves capable as a mobile suit pilot with new type capabilities, murders her own father, probably without even realizing it, and just like, at first she's like, oh, there's so many dead. It, it feels horrible to kill so many people. Anyway! <laughs> anyway, yeah, so they, they throw, so Char just throws her out there with a, with a, with in one of the, the Jack Dodogas. Which is the the Neo Zeon mass produced mobile mass suit. produced, not the Dogas, but the the Jag Dogas. And uh, she uh, she kills her dad. Yeah, I mentioned that. <laughs> yep, kills her dad and everything. Don't oh, even realize it. Doesn't even realize it, and she's got like this weird. It's like she she half realizes she did something wrong. Anyway, let's move on. Yeah, anyway, let's That's move on. That's basically her attitude. She's like, she acknowledges she did that all the death it was horrible, but doesn't learn from that experience. Yeah. And she then never she... has a change of heart. She just keeps pushing forward with her because she's under the belief, well, well, oh, adults are stupid and I'm right because I'm a teenager and I know everything. Yep. So, uh, yeah, so... So yeah, Axis is stolen, and it's fucking stockpiled with nuclear weapons now. And they're planning on drop. They set a course for Earth and everything. And now that the Federation fleet that was already there is destroyed now, now they're now it's basically a race against time to stop Axis to from being stop Axis, on Earth yeah, and causing nuclear winter. And I think that's where we're gonna stop for right now. Sure, we're gonna. The rest of this is. A lot better than the first half of this movie, to be honest. Oh, fully, yeah. <laughs> the second half, I feel, is much better. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly because uh, 
Yeah. The first the first half is bogged down by a lot of politics and be, and uh, admittedly part of it is because they still have to develop the new characters that are introduced in this movie, like Chan Aggie, Hathaway Noah, Quest Pariah, new guy, yeah. new guy, yeah, new, whatever his the, name the is, the fake new type guy, yeah. Whose whole deal is like everybody looks down at me because I'm a I'm a manufactured new type. I was like, bitch, Char has you like as like practically second in command when it comes to mobile suits, and you're like, I I could be better than him. I could be better than him. Sure, pal. Maybe in your dreams. <laughs> sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you. So, what's your favorite scene in the movie? The ending. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's the ending. It, it's, it's the ending. Although a close second is the fist fight between Char and Anna. <laughs> that one's just it's funny. <laughs> they're just throwing, they're just on, scrapping on the ground as he kicks them up. <laughs> Flips them over. Flip, does a monkey flip on him. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Uh, favorite character? Char. I mean, it's either Shar or Amaro. I mean, by default, it's those two. No, it's Bright Noah. I mean, hey, he's, <laughs> he's a solid choice, for sure. My favorite is Hathaway. Oh. <laughs> no, my least favorite is Quest. Uh, yeah. Like. I can, I can tell. She, no, it's just like. If you take her out of the movie entirely and re and rewrite the movie around her not being around, I still feel like it would be a better movie. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Hathaway's only motivation in this entire movie is, where is Quest? Why, why is Quest not here? I'm going to rescue Quest. And that's his entire motivation. That's his entire movie. motivation. This is the first introduction for this guy. Well, te technically, he showed up in Zeta, but he was too young to actually matter. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> As a proper character. Right. <laughs> like I said, he was too young to matter back then. Now he's old enough to actually do stuff on his own. And yeah. he, he botches it so hard. Ugh. I, I realized we kind of forgot to address the elephant in the room with regards to this movie and mobile and Gundam as a whole. Yeah. Uh, Toru Furia, the actor for Amuro Ray, oh, yeah. is an absolutely a terrible person. It has recently come to light. Yep. <laughs> like, he, he had... To basically summarize what happened, he had an extramarital affair with a fan that lasted for four years, during which time he was abusive to his mistress and convinced her to get an abortion. <laughs> and this is not speculation. This is all a stuff he has admitted to and openly apologized for. I mean, on the one hand, good for him for apologizing, but dude, seriously, this didn't need to have happened. This should not have happened in the first place. I'm not one to judge someone on an extramarital affair. Or even, like, convincing someone to get an abortion. That's, you know, that's their business. It's the abuse I have a problem with. To... To... to Provide a bit more context. His his rationale for yeah. Well, he, he, he did it for a selfish reason. He, he did it for his career. He was yeah. trying. He was looking out for his career, and that's that's what pushes it into. God damn, terrible. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's. I'm not saying he's a good person. I'm just saying that's you know the extramarital affair is not my place to judge. So it has subsequently tainted all the roles he's had: Amuro Ray, Tuxedo Mask, Yamcha. But he didn't even do anything as Tuxedo Mask. <laughs> <laughs> I've been watching the anime, and he does quite a bit. He just has no superpowers, and most of his appearances just amount to, hey, I showed up to save you. Okay, bye. <laughs> so. <laughs> slightly more competent than the titular character, but only slightly. <laughs> yeah. So, as just... Uh, what's one thing that you do like about the movie? 
Psycho Frame. The Psycho Frame. I, I it's, feel it's, it's a inter- great visual. It's a great. It's a. I. It's an interesting concept, since it is a material that works with sight with new types. Yeah. Expanding on the new type idea. I mean, it would make sense that they would explore more options for new types and stop posing like that. It's, it's weird and out of context for anybody who's only listening, which is literally everybody other than I'm us. Stre- I'm stretching because I'm <laughs> trying to fucking... Oh, God damn. No, the, the Psycho Frame's a great visual. Like, I'll give it this. It's got good visuals. Oh, absolutely. It's got it's a much better visual spectacle than fucking Zeta movies. Oh, absolutely. Which are which botch everything. Hey guys, let's fucking let's jump back and forth between the '80s look and then like the 2017 look of anime where it's all <laughs> I don't know, man. I think it was like mid mid 2000s. I could I, be wrong. I, I don't can't remember. Know. But it's like the, you know, the... The, the more modern look. The more modern look. Yeah, it absolutely clashes. But thankfully, since this movie was wholly made in the 80s, it has a consistent look. <laughs> yep. Um, I will say that the, the the final... Like, none of the fights match the, the, the sheer spectacle of the... Uh, the, cl- the big climactic battle. The big climactic battle of uh, Mobile Suit Gundam. Which, yeah, I don't think anything in the series could beat that. Except maybe some of the fights in G Gundam. <laughs> well, that, that show is like 95% fighting. <laughs> yeah. But, goddamn. <laughs> goddamn. Goddamn. <laughs> so what would you rate this movie? Honestly, like a 7 out of 10. Yeah, I would agree. Seven out of ten. If you take out quests and rewrite and rewrite a few things, it could easily be like an eight out of ten. But like quest, dra- unironically, quest drags the film down by being just a just a like a, a, not a good character. It's not a good character in the sense that oh she's a teenager and blah blah blah. It's that you didn't need to make her this bad. You could you could have made her naive. Gonna, you know. I mean, one would argue that she totally is. I mean, she is, but not like... She's obnoxiously naive. She's a... Yeah. She, no, it's not even that she's naive. It's that she's the kind of naive where it's, she is She is 100% the prime example of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Yes. Absolutely. I know better than adults. <laughs> I don't need to learn anything. I know everything. You're all stupid adults. Nobody understands. And it's like, then tell us! Don't just sit there and fucking pout and act like everyone else is stupid when you don't fucking explain your fucking feelings. This is why you need therapy, lady. (laughs) Fucking talk about your feelings. That's part of the reason why I hate hate Common Rider Fies. I forgot the name of that show. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like a lot of the conflicts in that show could be avoided if the characters just talked to each other and were open with each other. No, that is no. Seriously, it's such a bad anime trope. The the the, the like you you see it all the time in fucking harem and like some shonen anime where it's like the guy gets you know the it's the 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 perv moment where the guy is it's all a misunderstanding and the the girl fucking slaps him or whatever and it's like just communicate i I was thinking more along the lines of like the brooding sasuke type right yeah well (laughs) that too but no it's just like a general lack of communication in in anime it's it's a common trope. Oh, absolutely. You got the brooding. You got the brooding character who doesn't want to talk about his feelings and doesn't feel and feels like he nobody understands him. And it's like, fuck it, just talk then. Just maybe they might. Maybe they don't. What's the worst that could happen? That they don't understand you. <sighs> I mean, I th- I think a decent subversion of that does occur in Naruto early on, when Sasuke and. Or Sa- Sasuke and Sakura are having a conversation, and Sakura is like, "I don't like Naruto because he, he because he doesn't have parents. He thinks he can do whatever he wants." And Sasuke is like, "You make me sick. <laughs> you lit- you make me sick." <laughs> yeah, it- because, because for context, Sasuke's parents were murdered. <laughs> 
right. by his brother. <laughs> he he understands Naruto a bit better than Sakura does. So while he dislikes Naruto, it's not for the reasons that Sakura does. <laughs> Like, at the very least, he can empathize with Naruto. It's like... <laughs> yeah, it's like, If I, you don't have any sympathy for him not, because he doesn't have any parents, you're a terrible person. <laughs> you know, you, the, yeah, the kids all make fun of... Like, all the kids make fun of Naruto, and even, like, the adults make fun of Naruto. And it's like... He, dude, Naruto's like the result of the ultimate sacrifice. What the fuck have you guys done? <laughs> oh, but he, he's got the nine tails in him. It's like, is that all you're seeing about this kid? The fact that he's got something inside him that nobody's allowed to talk about? <laughs> it's like, I feel Naruto is a, gets, some, gets a great character development over the course of his series because, especially after he learns like, that in the first chapter, like, he's like, oh, okay. Well, I'm going to prove to everybody that I'm more than just here's, that. <laughs> here's, here's the thing. Naruto's, Naruto's not a show about ninjas fighting or everything. It's, it's a show about a kid who wants to be respected. And, we're, and gets his respect because through hard work and, tr and, and working very hard to achieve your dreams and always being true to your principles, you'll get that. As if you stick to your principles and you work as hard as you possibly can at what you want, you will be respected for it. And then Boruto happened, and I haven't even been keeping track of yeah, and then Bo that. And then Boruto happened, and he's like, here's my spoiled rich kid <laughs> who's kind of a doofus. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I achieved what I want. Fuck him. I, mean, I really need to get caught up on that, because apparently I'm only a fourth of the way through the manga. Apparently that only had 20 volumes <laughs> before being rebranded. I, I don't care about the anime. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I barely care about the Boruto <sighs> manga, but yeah. So what would you, what's your recommendation? Well, lately I've been watching quite a bit of Urusei Yasura. Yep. But since you already recommended that, I can't recommend it. Yep. However, I have also been on a, a Rumiko Takahashi kick in, in the meantime. So I just finished uh, watching the first Blu-ray set of Inuyasha, so that's what I'm going to recommend. Okay, I don't think we've done that yet. Nope. <laughs> uh, I haven't had much need to talk about it, but I've been watching it. It's Inuyasha's so great. It's it's Rumiko's most famous. At least what? here in the West. At least here in the West. I mean, it's a god, yeah, god forbid, it was huge in the early 2000s. Oh, absolutely. To the point where I think it was the very first time that Robot Chicken referenced anime that was modern. <laughs> yeah. I think... I think the only reason they were able to get away with that it was because it was airing on the same channel. <laughs> it was one of the... Let, put this into perspective. We talked uh, a, a while ago, like a long time ago, about the Toonami and the Adult Swim block. But Inuyasha was... Among the very first shows on the Toonami block, along with, you know... Cowboy Bebop along with, the first. Along with Cowboy Bebop and Dragon Ball Z and all these other shows. And that, that sort of, you know, that sort of... It's staying power is that it's a very nostalgic show for a lot of people who grew up in that time period and watched Toonami. Uh, for the record, the series is about a, a girl, a schoolgirl, Kagome Higarashi, who one day accidentally falls down the well on her, uh, on her family's property, which is a shrine, and she finds herself in the Sengoku period of Japan, which is infested with demons, <laughs> and she has to befriend a f previously sealed away half-demon by the name of Inuyasha, in order to uh, recover the shattered pieces of a jewel that I'll, can give demons a lot of power. And I'm just stalling for time at this point. So for the for the moment, I'm going to pause it until we get back. And we're back. <laughs> yep. So my recommendation, I don't got one this I week. mean, uh, we could keep talking about Andy Asher because I just yeah. was explaining the, the premise and not, not much else. Right. Yeah, no, it's good. <laughs> it's good. No, I, you know, I like any any Ash. I haven't seen too much of it. You know what? Tell you what, I'm gonna recommend a show that was also on the same block. I'm gonna recommend Yu Yu Hakusho. Okay. 
Yeah, Yu Yu Hakusho is a weird, weirder show. It's it's definitely more shonen. Absolutely, it is. Yeah, it's like a so it's shonen adjacent to Inuyasha, and it's like it's outright shonen. It was in Shonen Jump. <laughs> It so is. if yep. it's not shown, and then uh, and it must have been published in the wrong magazine. <laughs> I'm just fucking saying. So what's it about? It is about a delinquent high schooler. I forget his name. Now. Yusuke Urameshi. Yep, Yusuke Urameshi, who, uh, uh, he's, he's a giant delinquent. He's very famous in, in his town. For, for being a delinquent. For being a delinquent, like, people fear him or loathe him. And he dies saving a kid from being hit by a car. Yeah, because... Except, turns out the kid wasn't going to get hit by a car. Yeah. So he wound up sacrificing himself for literally no reason. <laughs> yep. And, and because he died, uh, they give him... The opportunity to come back to life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they gave him the opportunity. The afterworld was like, you weren't supposed to die? <laughs> like, that kid you saved, he wasn't even in danger of dying? But tell you what, tell you what. <laughs> we got a job for you. We have actually have an open position as a spirit detective. Well, they don't give him that, that offer until he actually manages to successfully come back from the dead. Well, but, right. But it's like, okay, well, now that you are mortal, have knowledge of the afterworld... Uh, Want to work for us fighting demons? <laughs> and he's just like, yeah, all right. And it's really cool because like he meets up other characters. He has like a vitriolic. Ba- they 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 keep saying that he's his rival, but really they're best buds. And they don't want to admit it. And it's Kuwabara. Kuwabara, who's the big. Hey guys, it's me, Kuwabara. <laughs> I'm the biggest fucking doofus in the world. He talks like that. Oh, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember the actor's name because he plays Piccolo and Vegeta in Dragon Ball Z. Chris Sabat? Yes! <laughs> yeah, Christopher Sabat. Hey! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, for real. If you listen hard enough, you can definitely hear, like, Piccolo and the Vegeta right. mixed between. And it just sounds like this. Like, admittedly, while I'm more familiar with Dragon Ball, whenever I think of Chris Abbott, I think of I think of Kuwabara, <laughs> or or the the the, the memeable fucking, ha! Huh, you missed all of my vital organs, all of them. <laughs> oh, Sabat! <laughs> I missed all of them. No. <laughs> I. I Really should check that series out at some point if I get a chance. To. Yeah, Yu Yu Hakusho is fucking great, <laughs> and he also it, like he has a girlfriend, but he also has like a like a spirit detective partner partner who's also a girl, and so it's like, yeah, it it's all sorts of confusing <laughs> for him. I think she claims like she's his cousin or something. I think that's like the real life ex- explanation they yeah. try to get to yeah. deflect the fact that she's technically a spirit <laughs> creature. Yep. She's literally the Grim Reaper. <laughs> Not very good at it, but nevertheless. <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Uh, but yeah, and he gets like he gets like a couple of other buddies, and so it's like six people. It's like just a group of six people, the two girls and four guys that are basically like destined to be heroes, and they is that, is that counting the old lady who teaches him some technique? Or no, something? that's not counting. Okay. So that would be seven. <laughs> I'm actually on that arc right now. Okay. With the, the the master tournament. There's a funny scene where it's like, hey, here's this assassin businessman fighting. <laughs> I forget what who he's fighting exactly, but. He's like an assassin businessman, and they go into it, and they, the the whole thing is it's like a tournament, right? Right. And they they go into the darkness. It's like one v one, and they go into the darkness, and all you hear is, <laughs> and when and one of them walks out, right? Until you get into like one of the main characters are fighting somebody else. So then, so then in that case, you actually see the action. <laughs> Right. I, th- so, I think they do pull that all the time. I think. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they did it with Gara at some point or something. Probably. 
Like, I'm pretty sure he kills off a character off screen before some big tournament. <laughs> like he was he was supposed to face off against this guy and that guy just died. <laughs> yeah, pretty that guy's much. Dead. Big dude. We don't get to see how awesome he is. Though granted we did get to see how awesome he was before that, but that's neither here nor there. But yeah, no, with Inuyasha, it's uh it's also got some uh other side characters like the perverted monk with a black hole in his hand. Uh, the yep. little kid fox spirit <laughs> who's just kind of mischievous but he's also you know real little so he doesn't understand most of the adult talk that's going on right and then you have the demon hunter whose whole village was slaughtered by by demons <laughs> and she is le initially led to believe that Inuyasha is the one who did it <laughs> she I wonder how that could have happened it was the big bad guy telling her that that's what yeah, happened. Yeah, pretty much. That's how it always is. <laughs> it's the big, bad, big bad evil guy manipulating people. Yeah, it's it's, think... it's it's a stark contrast to Takahashi's earlier works like Ranma One Half and Urase Yatsura. And it definitely focuses a bit more on the action and romance and horror aspects, though not not like like straight horror. It's just like implicit horror. Because monsters. Yeah. Uh, I will say my favorite... This is just a side tangent. My favorite big bad evil guy moment is, I think, from... Uh, I think it's from uh, Batman, uh, Batman Beyond or whatever. Where it's... Uh, it's uh, What's his name? The Batman. Uh, Terry? T Terry, Terry McGiver, Terry McGivens, McGinnis, McGinnis, or whatever, and he goes, "You killed my dad," and the big bad evil guy is like, "Do you have any idea how little that narrows narrows it down?" <laughs> <laughs> like, not even remorse or like joy, but like slight indignation at like. <laughs> What the fuck are you talking about? Which one? Could you be more? Could you yeah. be more specific? Could you be more specific? <laughs> I I love that moment. It's great. So, I guess suppose we better get back to. I it. guess. So we're at the we're basically at the big battle now. Like it's a couple big battles. There's like a break in between. Yeah, they... I know that one point Gune attempts to uh, dissuade Quest from. Uh, going after Shar by basically calling him a pedophile. <laughs> yeah, that that was kind of out of pocket. Yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> I mean, technically there's precedent, but like historically and even counting all the spin-off materials, no there's not. <laughs> yeah, no no there's not. Like the the only example Gune offers is the care is he knows that Shar was in a relationship with Lala. But he was, like, 19 and 20, and she was 17. Also, Lala had agency. Right. Lala is definitely a, a much better character than Quest. I'm just saying that Gune basically is like, oh, did, did you know he was into an underage girl? I mean, yeah, when there was only a three-year difference between their ages. <laughs> and according to the origin, they actually met probably when he was, when he was also underage. So... Yeah. So it's like, it's not that weird. And I know that Zeta and Double Zeta implied that uh, Shar and Haman had a relationship. But the spinoff manga, uh, Shar's Deleted Affair, Portrait of a Young Comet, reveals that that was basically one-sided on Haman's part. <laughs> like, she, she, she basically acts a bit more like Quest in this. Char, so here's the thing. Shar liked Lala, and that's it. Like, his current like girlfriend and quest he does not give a shit about them he is oh, I, I would argue he he's okay with uh his 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 girlfriend in this movie i don't think he gives a shit though like he's, I, he's manipulating them both uh, admittedly there is that but he does share a tender moment with her where he's a bit open about about it with Shit, I can't remember her name, but historically, he's been in relationships with age-appropriate women. Reko Aland, uh, the woman he had a relationship in Char's Deleted Affair, which ended absolutely tragically, and that was kind of Haman's fault. <laughs> After she found out that she had gotten pregnant, 
And Char never learned of that. Lala. Lala. And this person. <laughs> this person. It's like, seriously, I can't remember her name, and she got a whole manga dedicated to her. It's like, why the fuck can't I remember her name? Admittedly, she's not super important, but she's... Yuna is like, oh, he's only in a relationship with her to put up put up appearances. He's really into young girls. It's like, no. <laughs> like, even later in the movie, he outright confronts Shara about that, and he's like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> like, oh, I, I love that. Shara walks up to him, yeah, because Qu- Quest goes to Shara and, like, complains to him about everything, and Shara comes up, comes up to this guy, and he's like, Listen, I don't give a shit about Quest, alright? Just fucking quit saying out of pocket shit, motherfucker, or I will fucking slap you down harder than your mo- than your mother ever did. Like he, his entire interactions with Quest are basically like like, yeah, sure, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, whatever you say. Whatever you say, I'll deal with it. Whatever you say, I'll deal with it. I'll have a talk. Like even Shar outright admits that Quest basically has a father complex. She's basically using Char as a replacement dad, thinking that the the relationship should be more intimate. I was like, no. <laughs> like you can tell that Char is just manipulating her the, through all their interactions, mm-hmm. but at the same time, you can also tell that Char is just dealing with it. He's not, <laughs> he's not perpetuating their relationship. He's just like, yeah, okay, whatever, <laughs> sure. He he's using it to gain his he's own. He's humoring it. her. Yeah. He's using it to his own ends. Like you can, you can definitely tell that he's just using her. And so the big battle happens, and we've got, and so they they send quests on the big new mobile, Alpha Zera, the Alpha Zera, right? Does fuck all for her because she fucking sucks, and she gets murked. She gets fucking murked. All right, she dies. All right. Spoiler alert: she dies. She dies at the hands of a damaged Regeze. Yep. Which, for context, is the mass-produced version of the of the Zeta Gundam, in much the same way that Jim's were the mass-produced. Doesn't doesn't version somebody of the doesn't somebody else also die? Because uh, because Amuro fights the 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 guy that's thirsting over Quest. Which, uh, um, yes, it's Astonage's girlfriend who just gets introduced in this movie. Yeah. And I feel bad for Astonage because I think it's implied that he also dies in an explosion, and that guy was around has been around since Zeta. <laughs> It's like, that guy had development. I yep. do talk about him because he's barely in the movie. But dude had had shit going for him. And that all got fucked up. <laughs> yep. So basically, everyone dies at the end. So, sh- yeah, Shang in, in, in her damaged mobile suit kills fucking Quest. And Hathaway's like, why'd you do that? <laughs> yeah, and kills, kills Chang. <laughs> it like, and, <laughs> and it's like, why? <laughs> what is wrong with you? And the bizarre thing is, in subsequent media, people people basically congratulate Hathaway for shooting down a mobile suit during the battle, despite being an amateur, failing to realize that it was literally friendly fire, and the mobile suit he shot was already severely damaged. And he doesn't even regret it. No. <laughs> he never regrets killing an ally. <laughs> Hathaway is an asshole. And he got a whole movie dedicated to him that I wish they would make more of because that would justify me making that huge thing on my on my collection of model kits. Because <laughs> I was under the impression there were going to be three movies, and so far it's only been one. So yeah, Sh- so yeah, Shang's dead and Quest is dead. Hathaway disappears for the rest of the battle. Basically, I mean, because he's basically a big ball of depression. Because Quest is dead. Ugh, she didn't, dude. She didn't even like you, dude. She barely acknowledged you existed. Granted, fucking teenagers. S- fucking simps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, Quest is simping after Char, and Hathaway's simping after Quest. And y- Yune is <laughs> simping after Quest. Does, uh, does Yune die? I'm pr- pretty sure Yune, Yune dies. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he gets killed trying to protect Quest by Amuro. <laughs> yeah, I... I can't remember the exact details because the ca- climax is a bit of a clusterfuck. Yeah, all that ma- all that matters, all that matters is we get the Amuro versus we get Amuro versus Shar three, and it's 
a great fight scene. And somehow, Char loses all three battles. Yeah. Like, think about that. Like, he almost won the first one. Right. Actually, no, I think this is the fourth battle. He almost wins the, the first one, gets decimated on the second one, loses Lala on the third, uh, uh, like, loses Lala on the second one. Fifth. It's the fifth. Fifth, fifth one. Loses Lala on the, yeah, loses Lala on the fourth one. No, the third, fifth th one. The fourth one is at the end of the Wonder yeah. War. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. And the fourth one, he gets a scar from from Amaro. And this one, he they, they both... Like, this one's the only one where he could argue it's a stalemate if he was alive. Amaro does manage to uh, dispose of most of the nukes on Axis, rendering the whole plant plot to oh! initiate nuclear winter. Right! <laughs> oh, and then Bright Noah... Bright Noah has, like, an undercover team go into Axis and plant bombs to destroy it. Which ends up breaking Axis in half. Unfortunately, one of the halves is still on a descent course for Earth, and it is... There is nothing they can do about it. So Amuro is like, okay, Char, I've got your escape capsule. Uh, he just shoves it into the side of the side of the asteroid and is like, stay there. Okay, I'm gonna push this out of out of its descending orbit with my mobile suit. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and then like a bunch of other mobile suits <laughs> from both the Federation and Neo Zeon are like, well shit, we should probably help. <laughs> and Armor's like, no, no, I got this. I got this, guys. I'm making it sound like he's whiny in this scene, but it's actually an incredibly well done scene. Yeah, he's just like, he's like, guys, you're all gonna die. Only I can do this. Stop! <laughs> Meanwhile, Char is just like, ah, oh, the atmosphere. He turns, he Char turns into William Shatner for a moment. He's just like, my God, the atmosphere, the heat. We're all going to die. Amaro. What are you doing? Stop! <laughs> Stop this at once! This is a foolish endeavor! It's like, no. No, dude. I'm a new type. <laughs> dude, I gave you the new type. I gave you the psycho friend because if I lost to... Because if I beat you with just a regular mobile suit, it wouldn't have been satisfying. I had to beat you as a new type. It's like, well, bitch. <laughs> Amaro, uh, yeah, Amaro's new type powers hadn't even awoken yet, and he had defeated him in twice. Are we talking about during the One Year War? During the One Year War. No, I think the first two times they were technically stalemates because Amaro manages to escape with his well, life. Well, right. <laughs> well, but a stalemate is as good as a win during during the One Year War. Right. Like, he... like Of, of course it's a stalemate, but... She, uh, the Gundam surviving is a loss for Char and Zeon. Right. Because that was the whole reason why... Okay, fair enough, fair enough. That, that was the whole reason they went there in the first place, was to destroy the Gundam. Or at least capture them for themselves. I yeah. Mean, that's what they did in Seed. And they were arguably a lot more successful there than in the original series. <laughs> yeah. But that's a whole other topic for another day. <laughs> so then the, the Psycho Frame actually, like, activates and does its job. It causes what comes to be known as Psycho Shock. Mm hmm And so, like, all the other Gundams are put out of action. They're not destroyed. They're just deactivated. Like, only a couple of them blow up, but all the other ones are, like, basically deactivated and fall off the asteroid harmlessly. Basically. Because even the Ze cause even the Neo Zeon suits. suits were like, oh, fuck, this is actually a terrible idea. Uh, yeah, no, what were we thinking? What were, <laughs> what were we thinking? Destroying the entirety of Earth? And this is the other thing that gets me, is Char's plan makes no fucking sense. I understand that he wants the planet to heal itself, but in, when you initiate a nuclear winter, that's only going to take longer. Right, but it would discourage anybody from returning to Earth for a long time, which was kind of what he was trying to go for. I mean, uh, I mean arguably a nuclear meltdown... Uh, didn't stop life from thriving in the Chernobyl exclusion yeah, no, zone. No, exactly. I mean, I mean, I I think that's basically what he was going for: make it unhabitable for humans, but allow the rest of nature to basically take take back the planet. Well, there's. I'm not saying he was in the right. No, Char's absolutely in the wrong here. Like 
he goes from he goes from like morally gray in Mobile Suit Gundam to more to morally good in in Zeta. And this is his this is his this is this is his moral event horizon, as it were. I mean I mean, murdering your friend in cold blood in the in the one year war, I mean or murdering somebody who considered you a friend <laughs> by tricking them and then gloating about it. Yeah, I don't know, man. It was, I mean he gloated to him about it, but like immediately after I was like well, shit, now I, d I don't feel good. <laughs> I don't feel good. That wasn't as satisfying as I thought it would be. <laughs> Who knew revenge isn't actually satisfying? Unless your name is Inigo Montoya. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then it's very satisfying. Well, to be fair, Garma didn't kill Shara's father. Garma's father allegedly killed Shara's father. <laughs> right. <So. laughs> Yeah, the whole thing is, yeah, it's, it's... But yeah, ultimately, Amaro manages to push Axis out of its descending orbit so that it clears the Earth and floats off into space. The Earth is saved. Amaro and Shar die. And the war, I guess, ends for the time being? Until it doesn't? Yeah, for now. <laughs> But, so yeah, that's, that's that. Hey. After Shar's counterattack, there would be another movie, Gundam F-91, which we'll talk about at some point, and then a subsequent television series, Victory Gundam, which is currently the last television series set in the Universal Century. Yep. That isn't just ad adapted from another series are set during another series it's I guess I should explain that a bit better after Victory Gundam there were like OVAs set during other points in the one in the in the Universal Century like 0083 Stardust Memory the OFMS team the OMS team is real good oh yeah uh, 0080 I, War in the you pocket. know what I'm pretty sure MS team was also on Toonami yes Yep. Yes, it absolutely was. I'm pretty sure that's the that's that's a lot of people's introductions to Gundam. That and the that and the PlayStation Two games. Right, right, right. Okay. I mean, technically, the first Gundam series to actually get way was G Gun. It was G Gundam. I no, think. it was Wing. Oh, was Wing, it Wing? Gu Gundam Wing got to more mo was on first. Gotcha. So that so it has a legacy in that regard and then right and then G Gundam came out around the same a little afterwards and then it just kind of went from there <laughs> yeah Mobile Suit Gundam then started airing on Toonami and was cancelled in the wake of the 9-11 attacks and flagging viewership which is kind of ironic since that was kind of why it was cancelled originally in the first place <laughs> yep No, that sounds about right. But yeah, so there's been plenty of other media set in the Universal Century before they decided to be like, okay, we've done enough with the Universal Century in terms of what goes on TV. Uh, let's just have giant robots punching each other for a bit. <laughs> and thus we got G Gundam. And then that was followed up by the super dense plot of Gundam Wing. And they've just kind of been doing offshoots of Gundam and set in their own universes ever since. Pretty much, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's sort of Gundam in a nutshell. And this is sort of, this is the end of Amaro and Char. But it's not the end of our time talking about Universal Century entries. <laughs> yeah. Whenever we get around to it, we're definitely going to be talking about the Unicorn movies. <laughs> so 7 out of 10? 7 out of 10 for short Counterattack, yeah. I definitely, I don't know if this is better or worse than Encounters in Space. Encounters in Space is two, right? Or Three. <laughs> three. Okay, so three is the ten out of ten one. Oh, absolutely. Uh, two, which one was two? Uh, two was, uh... Uh, Soldiers of Sorrow. Soldiers of Sorrow, yeah. Which was, which as, I mean, Soldiers of Sorrow is, was basically like the Clone Wars. 
or Attack of the Clones of the Gundam series, where it's like, it's long, it's boring, and it's mostly just people talking. But it is also important. <laughs> it is also very important. It leads up to everything that happens in the third movie. And thankfully, the first movie had no, was in no way comparable to Phantom Menace. <laughs> no, it was, more, it, was, it was more comparable to The Force Awakens than anything. Which is, <laughs> I will argue, Force Awakens is a better... better it was the best of the uh, sequel trilogy. Yes. Which is not saying a lot, because the last the, the other two movies are terrible. <laughs> I, men I mentioned this in the past, but it, my, my list goes uh, Empire Strikes Back, A New Hope, uh, Revenge of the Sith, and then Return of the Jedi, and then it goes, uh, for me... For me, at least, it would. It then goes. Uh, it then goes. Base the Phantom Menace or the the Force Awakens, the Phantom Menace, uh, the Last Jedi, Rise of Skywalker, and then Attack of the Clones. <laughs> yeah. Like, I would argue that Attack of the Clones is a better movie, but th that's purely I mean, opinion. I mean, when it's bottom of the barrel, brother, you know. <laughs> Now, where would you put Rogue One and, and Solo? Uh, Rogue One is just above Force Awakens, and Solo is probably... Right in the trash can. Uh, yeah, good, glad we yeah, agree on that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Solo, Solo probably goes uh, just under The Last Jedi. It's... it's I, I, I seriously am questioning why they even made that movie. Because, of because like, they wanted to explain Han Solo's backstory. Like okay, it, but like it needed need to? <laughs> like it needed to be explained, yeah. No, that's the problem. <laughs> but that's that's a topic for when we get around to talking about the Star Wars movies, eventually. <laughs> yeah. So with that said, I suppose that's our... That's our Char's counterattack was... It's fine. Pre pretty okay. It's fine. It's a fine movie. If you if you're interested in what happens after after Mobile Suit Gundam, Zeta, and Double Zeta, Char's Counterattack is what you need. And then Unicorn happens after, right? Right, but that wouldn't be released for a, quite a few yeah, years. Yeah, that wouldn't be happen. For that a will be what we cover next when we talk more about Gundam at some point in the future. We've got plans to do other stuff in the meanwhile. Correct. So with that said, we'll see you later. Bye. Bye.